Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Positive Parenting with Astrology. I am your host and resident Gemini, Maria Rieger, and I am super excited to have another Gemini here with me today, Rebecca Block, <laughs> who uh, is a mom, a PhD, and has worked extensively in higher education and with nonprofits working in K-12 education. Rebecca has written a book that we're going to talk about that, frankly, if there was one parenting book about adolescents and teens that you need to read this year, it's this book. So we're going to talk about it and um, all about how this book can help you teach your adolescents and kids how to be motivated on their own. Okay, really important stuff. So Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here talking about all this stuff. It's it's near and dear to my heart for so many different reasons. Like you mentioned, I've been working in education for almost two decades. I have two kids of my own. And also, I'm just a super nerd. Um, I've, I've cared about education back since I was in high school going, wait a second, it doesn't seem like it should work this way. Isn't there a better option? So. Well, as you point out in the book, which we're going to want to introduce in a second, um, you know, we prize individualism, which I do too. My, all my viewers know that I'm a rugged individualist. I abhor groupthink. I, I want people to think for themselves. Yes, figure out how, you know, you can interact with society, but think for yourself at the end of the day. But our education system is largely one size fits all. And, you know, so that's, it, it's, we're getting conflicting messages. But first, before we get into all that, I'd like you to um, please, I, uh, uh, share with us the title of the book and what led you um, to to want to write a book like this and, you know, your experience, how your experience work in higher education shaped the book. Yeah, yeah. So the title of the book is Can You Help Me Give a Shit? Unlocking Teen Motivation in School and Life. And the origin story for this book is actually about four years ago, a colleague of mine who is teaching a class um, in a high school uh, where she was focused on like study skills, executive functioning skills, time management, all the kind of things that you need to be able to be successful, not just in academics, but also in the work world. She asked her students, what's one thing you really want to get out of this class? And they all wrote back their responses anonymously on a piece of paper. And one that particularly struck her was a student who wrote, can you help me give a shit about high school? I want to, but I just don't know how. And she came to myself and another colleague because we had been working with high school and college students for so long and also are super nerdy researchers. And she was like, listen, y'all, I know executive functioning like the back of my hand, but I don't know academic motivation. What do I do to help the student? And like any good nerd, I wanted to give her a book to read, right? I'm like, let's let, you know, let's talk about it. Sure. Let's talk about specific classroom strategies. I can give you those, but also let me give you a good book to read something that you can, you know, chew on or reflect on. And I went to find her one. I was like, man, none of these are going to actually help her connect with and understand what this teen is expressing and why the structure of high school by and large makes it very hard to build and sustain motivation. So I decided to write one. I just I started talking with young people all over the country informally first and then did a series of formal interviews. And my first interviewee, I actually invited to become my co-author so that it would really be a multi-generational project. Um, and so that's really what this book is all about is I, I still build in all the research behind it. Um, but it's really about centering students' voices and experiences. How have they been experiencing motivation in school? What have they done to make it where they can feel more engaged and motivated? And what have the people around them done that have made a difference in either a positive or negative way? Gotcha. So we're talking about, is it kind of an extrinsic or intrinsic rather motivation? You call it autonomous motivation. That's a psychological term. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and autonomous motivation is a little different than intrinsic motivation. So give me permission to nerd out here for just yes. a moment. So mostly, most people are familiar with the intrinsic versus extrinsic kind of dichotomy, right? We tend to think of it as intrinsic is like, I am motivated to do this all my, just because it feels good, right? I'm in a state of intrinsic motivation when I'm drawing because I'm doing that purely because I want to. It is its own fulfilling thing. Extrinsic motivation is things like seeking gains or avoiding punishment, right? So I'm studying for this test because... I don't want to fail and I'm really afraid of the failure or I'm studying for this test because I really want to impress my mom or I want to impress my teacher and like I want that accolade that's going to come with it, right? That's Those are the kind of stereotypes of intrinsic and extrinsic. What a bunch of researchers in motivation science have discovered is that it's actually a little more nuanced than that. It's not an on-off binary. Autonomous motivation is more about 
are you it's it's a more sustainable kind of motivation that actually contains a mix of intrinsic and extrinsic so for instance if you are working at a hotel chain just to give a hypothetical example and you don't intrinsically find half the work that you're doing there to be motivating but you do find the connections you have with your colleagues, the benefits you're getting, the salary you're bringing home to allow you to fulfill on a larger thing that you value, right? So I value my ability to take care of my family, or I value my ability to connect with and talk with new people every day. That's more what autonomous motivation is, right? When you've got some mix of the two that allows you to sustain motivation over time and not be kind of burned out the way that extrinsic motivation does, but but not in kind of the idealized dream world that intrinsic motivation would have. Just do what you love and you never work a day in your life. It's like, well, okay, but can we have a visit with reality here? Like how many people are actually 100% of the time just doing what they love mm -hmm. and feeling super intrinsically motivated by it all the time? Well, that, that's um, a really good distinction because uh, a lot of people have difficulty, like they, they have an end goal of where they want to be, but they have difficulty doing all the steps to get there if the steps are not necessarily fulfilling in and of themselves. Like, right. I talk to a lot of people in the, you know, financial independence, retire early community that work jobs they may not like to do day to day, but it's for the end goal of then having this, you know, being able to be financially independent at 40 or 50 so that they can do whatever they want and do what they what they right. find fulfilling. So that's it's, it's what I'm hearing from you is it's important to have that end goal in mind. Like what what do you kind of want to get out of life? Like what are your goals? Where do you see yourself yes. in five, 10 years, whatever? And then what do you have to do to get there? There may be many routes to get there but at least have that goal in mind. And it's also making those shorter term sacrifices to mid to long term gains, which is harder and harder for people to do given the society we live in with exactly short term gratification. Yeah. Well, is it both so, both the short term gratification and that teens are very aware they can see right. what's going on the same as adults can that the world of work is changing and becoming mm -hmm. so much less predictable. And so the kind of like, well, if you do this, well in high school to get into a good college to do well in the college to get into a good medical school to do well in medical school to get a position as a doctor and then you work really hard to pay off all your student loans and then eventually you're going to be making good money right like that kind of very long-term goal planning right now there's two things that are making that hard for teens the first is they have this wonderful dopamine hit right in their pocket all the time like all of us do and this is distracting adults too from long-term goal pursuit but when you have like grown up being able to know you could just get that really quick hit of dopamine by grabbing something from your pocket it's really hard to commit to that longer arc hit of dopamine that is making progress towards a long-term goal the second thing though that's really interfering with it is they're looking and seeing how much the world of work is changing and how rapidly unpredictable it is software engineer used to be man you're going to be covered you're going to be cush you're fine that's a good safety job now looking like not so much of a great safety job right like so they see both of those things together and they're going what how do i set a long-term goal how do i how do i even know that i'm going to do all this work towards something that's going to that's going to pay off is that even going to still exist 10 years from now as a career right like there's that whole thing. The other piece that then comes into play is there's a lot of teens who don't know what they want to do. And that's fine. If we pressure someone who's 16 years old to like, what's your, I remember my grandfather used to be like, what's your 20 year plan, your 10 year plan, your five year plan. I'm like, I don't know. Right. And so then you have to figure out, well, how else can we get, how else can someone build the ability to feel motivated about what they're doing so that they can sustain the energy to do it well, or at least well enough every day, if it's not in relation to a long-term goal. And it's harder when it's not in relation to a long-term goal, but it is possible. And that was one of the things that was really important to me to get a better understanding of teens who had found other ways to feel motivated that weren't tied to a long-term goal. Um, Cause those teens that have long-term goals, they're pretty good, right? They're, they're, they're doing pretty fine, but that, but the ones who feel like they're supposed to and don't actually, they're really, they're, they're not doing so great. They're having a harder time and they're constantly getting the messaging that like, oh gosh, I can't get it together until I have this long-term goal. Let me just make one up. Sure. I want to be a doctor. That means I want to do pre-med. That means I better do science well, right? Like it, it's not, um, I'm jumping ahead of myself. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, 
Yeah, Merc so Mercury is still retrograde, so it always affects Gemini's really strongly. <laughs> so I'm all over the place. Like I had tech issues this week. It's just a big mess. So, so it's just how it is. You just got to embrace the energy, right? Um, so I want to get to, in a minute, the expectations, because that's mm-hmm. that's a big one. You talk a lot in the book about expectations, parents' expectations for teens in high school, mm-hmm. right? And how flexible expectations, right, like less strict expectations, generalizing, actually help teens kind of find their autonomous motivation, right? Mm-hmm. But before I get to that, um, something I want to... Uh, emphasize that you that you're touching on is that to feel motivated you also have to feel that you have some confidence in your abilities and competence and that you can do the thing exactly so that's why it's so important not to over parent not to do things for the kids and fix things and i want to get to you talk about parents their trigger is a lot of us to because of our own childhood issues to fix things we'll get to that too but um, so we have to let our kids do things on their own and fail and make mistakes. That's how they learn and also how they gain confidence in their abilities. Like, yes, I can do this. Yes, I can handle this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so would it be helpful if I walk through the, the ABCs? You yes. Motivation, I, ABCs yeah, let's get before. to that now. It's what okay. Good. okay. So in the book, I refer to it as the ABCs of motivation. Actually, since mm-hmm. then, in talks that I've been giving and when I'm working with um kids and families one-on-one I've been talking about is the ABCDs. So let me lay out what they are. A is for abilities. That's what you're just talking about. We need to feel like that we either have or we can build the abilities that we need to succeed in a given endeavor or context. We also need to feel like that the abilities that we need to build are actually going to be relevant to like, they're going to matter to other people. They're going to matter in something other. So for instance, if I'm in an algebra class and I don't think I can learn algebra, Obviously, I'm not going to be motivated to learn algebra, right? That's growth mindset. That's pretty well known. Less talked about is if I'm in an algebra class and I think I could learn algebra if I really worked hard at it, but I don't think it's going to matter once I leave that algebra class that I learned those algebra skills. I don't think anybody else is going to value them. I don't think it's going to play into anything else that I'm going to do in my life. Then I'm also going to find it really hard to be motivated, right? So that's the abilities piece. B is for belonging, and it's not just at the level of the whole school, like, oh, I feel like I belong in my high school or my college. It's at the classroom level, right? I feel like that actually inside my algebra class, my teacher actually cares about whether or not I do well, not just because they need to keep their numbers up, because otherwise they're going to get in trouble, but because they actually care about me as a person. This does not mean they think I'm their best friend. It does not mean that I'm confessing to them everything about my personal life. And like, you know, but it does mean that I genuinely believe they actually care about me as a person and my success, not just because it's reflective of their success. It also means that I feel like there's at least one other classmate in my class who I can connect with about this difficult algebra stuff, right? Um, and, And we can help each other. C is for choices, and it's of the meaningful choice variety, right? So if I don't feel like that I got to choose whether or not I took algebra, I didn't get to choose which teacher I had for algebra, I didn't get to choose which classmates were in that particular algebra section with me, I didn't get to choose how I did the assignments, I didn't get to choose how I like prepped for the test, right? If I just got no meaningful choices all the way along the line, then even if I think that algebra is going to maybe be meaningful for me at some point, it's going to be really hard for me to sustain motivation kind of in the same way if you think about someone who has a mandatory workplace training, right? Like how many of us have had to do a mandatory workplace training? And then how many of us were like, oh yeah, I feel totally engaged in that learning. That's awesome. It's great. I'm so excited to learn this. We complain about doing it for three hours and they're doing it for 12 years, right? So then D, the piece that I don't explicitly talk about in the book, but has become more and more visible to me since um, putting it out there is dopamine. Right. And that's the piece that I was talking about before, that when we have devices in our pockets that have been designed to ensnare our attention and give us really quick hits of dopamine, it's really hard to instead use the the way that the dopamine system was kind of more designed to work in our brains as humans, which is to reward us as we pursue goals. Right. We get hits of dopamine when we pursue and make progress towards a goal. And that gives us the energy to keep going and keep pursuing a goal. Well, instead I can get it in 90 seconds playing a game on my phone or doom scrolling social media. Ah, it's going to be pretty hard for me to maintain my motivation to instead do the longer term goal pursuit. Right. And that doesn't just affect teens. It affects adults. The other piece that really plays a big role in the dopamine sort of baselines is that at Stanford success just came out with a study not too long ago. 90% of teens are sleep deprived. 
90% of them are not getting at least seven hours of sleep a night. And so then you, you're like, hello, right? Like you just, you're not going to be able to, your, your brain's not producing enough dopamine. It's not producing enough of anything. You're tired. You can't maintain the motivation to do anything. So the number of teens that I've worked with at this point now, my baseline in working with any teen who is, and family who's like concerned and they're trying to help their kid get engaged and motivated what they're doing. I start with, okay, we're going to do a phone audit. Let's open up and look at, we're going to go to the battery usage section. We're going to look at what, how much time is going into different apps. And then you're also going to track your sleep. And once we get your sleep to at least seven hours a night and your phone out of the room while you are trying to do any kind of like long-term endeavor, if you're studying, if you're doing homework, you're just like literally got to be out of the room because there's studies that show that even with me just having it face down, but in my line of sight, it's still actually occupying a percentage of my brain and slowing me down, right? The number of teens that I've worked with were literally just doing those two things. And suddenly two weeks later, they're like, oh my gosh, I'm finding school so much more enjoyable. And I feel like I can study, I can be done with my homework in two hours instead of four. And like, I have so much more time for other things and my classes are more interesting. And I'm like, okay, yeah, <laughs> we got to start with some of the basics here. So those are the ABCDs with too long of a, of a tangent about the dopamine part. Um, and all of those as parents, it, I have found it really helpful as a parent, I will say at least, and with the parents that I've worked with and talked with to understand them because then it allows you to do that kind of quick diagnostic. If I'm noticing that my teen is not feeling motivated, instead of me jumping in to solve it for them, can, can I give them the space to help them notice what might be off here and give them the chance to diagnose and come up with a potential solution and support them in enacting that solution um, rather than coming in and fixing and moving all the pieces around for them. It's important to when parents are interacting with teens and communicating with them about these issues to come from a place of, you know, judgment free place where you're not judging the teen's behavior. You're not judging that we're all, I mean, the smartphones and apps are made to be addictive. So it's not yeah. the teen's fault. They're addicted to it. Like you said, adults no. are addicted to it. Adults yep. with ADHD are addicted to it. Adults without ADHD get addicted to it. Right. <laughs> So, you know, my therapist who treats only adults tells me all day, every day, clients talk to her about procrastination. I know what I want to do. I just can't get past the procrastination of doing there. I guarantee the smartphone has something to do with that. Anyway, that's a big yeah. tangent. But right, it's important to when we're addressing our teens instead of you always do this or blah, blah. Like, look, I've noticed this. We need to address some of these issues. I sit down with my son who is almost 15. <laughs> And I talk and I'm like, look, we need to come up with some rules about phone use and homework, mm -hmm. phone use and X. What do you think? Here's what I'm thinking. What do you think about this? And we had a great conversation last week where he's like, well, I don't, I'm not comfortable with this, but I'll, I'll, you can lock my phone up after a certain, after at like eight or 9 PM during yeah. school nights. I'm mm -hmm. okay with that. I'm like, okay, that's fine. We can agree on that. Lock yeah. it up. And I, he's like, you know, some kids say, well, you don't trust me. And I, and I say, it's not about trust. It's about addiction and distraction. And I'll, I'll remind my son, sometimes, you know, parents have to do things you may not like, but I will always explain why I'm doing this. And, I, and I've said frequently on this channel, and I'll say it again here. I tell my son, I don't like rules. I don't. I like freedom. Okay. The rules I have that are no bargain rules in our home are there for reasons. They're not mm -hmm. for my benefit. They're for you, for, and yeah. they're mostly for health and safety, and the phone use is yeah. one of them. So if you come in at more, a more of a collaborative approach, especially with teens, I mean, shoot, when they're 18, many of them will be on their own, and they're going to have to deal with this stuff. So you're going to yeah. have to help them get yeah. there, right? So yeah. instead of just imposing rules, this is the way, and you have no say in this. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. No, the, the the how you're spot on matters tremendously, right? And the, the whole reason that I actually even started thinking more about the tech and dopamine piece is because when because of the young people that I spoke with when doing the research for this book, right? I, my co-author and I, the only question we were asking everybody was tell us about your most and least engaging learning experiences. What made the difference, right? And we were just having students share their stories. I did not come in asking about tech. I did not come in asking about choices. I, it was just, and didn't even keep it to school, right? Specifically said learning experiences rather than school experiences, because a lot of learning, a lot of the most meaningful learning experiences happen outside 
of the classroom. And it was fascinating to me that they brought up the tech, right? They brought it up and that caused me to start to go and discover more things and learn more about it and, and realize, okay, that transition, like we were talking about before we started recording, that transition from what works as a parent of an elementary age child to how you need to start to engage when your child enters middle school to then how it changes further when they enter high school, right? That's one of those things where I just had hard and fast rules that I set and still have them for my elementary schooler. For my middle schooler, there are certain things that I won't like a bunch of his friends already have smartphones. And I'm like, no, you don't know. You're not getting, you're not getting a smartphone. I've got to watch because I want to be able to call you and I want you to be able to call me and like text me. But no, you do not need a smartphone. You don't need all the apps. You don't need all the other stuff. You've got a, oh, a refurbed old Apple watch and that is sufficient. Right. And he's like, oh my gosh, this is so ridiculous. This is so unfair. Right. So, so it's not like I'm just like, whatever, all, all gates are open, but he'll want to talk to me about being allowed to watch more TV or being allowed to have more video game time. Right. And one of the, the switches that I made precisely because of this research that I've really been finding very helpful as a parent is that I, I just take an experimental mindset. Okay. You know what? I'm going to tell you what my hypothesis is. You tell me what your hypothesis is. How are we going to set up an experiment for a week? that allows us to both get more information to tell us if one of our hypotheses is right or if it's something else entirely, right? So my hypothesis is you get more video game time, you're gonna be more distracted, you're not gonna do your homework, you're not gonna sleep as well, right? Here's the things that I could look at that would tell me whether or not that's happening. It's whether or not you go and do your homework with me having to ask, it's whether or not that I'm seeing that it's being turned in on the parent portal, it's whether or not I'm getting any messages from your teacher about you seeming distracted in the school. What are the things that you would want to look at? What else would you want to look at of like, you know, how easy or hard it is to fall asleep? How motivated you're feeling? What are the things that matter to you? What are you hoping is going to get better if you are allowed this increase in screen time? And it has made it where then we are not arguing with each other's opinions. Instead, we're both agreeing on making a plan for an experiment of how we're going to find out what is actually true for him. Because he got understandably really sick of me being like, well, the research shows that blah, 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 right? And he's like, that research wasn't on me, mom. And so I'm like, fair. Okay, great. So let's do an actual little, <laughs> little mini research right here. And like, yes, I'm predisposed to that in part because I'm a nerdy researcher, but I don't think it's, I'm not doing like some inaccessible total social science experiment here, right? This is just to take it out of we're fighting about our difference in opinion and into how can we come to a shared set of information that we can then make an informed decision on. Because I want to model for him that that's the same thought process I hope he'll use as an adult too, right? Like as he's moving into more and more independent decision making, I hope that he'll go, huh, I'm not sure about this. How might I figure out what's a good idea rather than just throwing a dart at the wall and then being like, oh, never mind, <laughs> right? also test different things and we use that approach too it's so funny because they're both gemini's it's such, such a logical analytical thing to do that's what air <laughs> energy pushes you to do right i'll tell my son he's like well, i don't know about this rule i'm like you know what we're going to try it for two weeks we're going to do it this way for two weeks at the end of two weeks we're going to have a family meeting you and me and we're going to talk about what worked and what did but that way it's like i get more buy-in from him if he knows well it's not necessarily that this is going to be the, the rule forever it's just we're going to try this Maybe we decide to keep it, maybe we don't, right? But, and you talk about this in the book too, uh, when we're interacting with our kids, approach from a place of curiosity about them. Again, like we said, no judgment, like curiosity and an interest in them as a person. And the, the, teens, the, younger, the teens and young adults you interviewed in the book, they all said this, that they, their relationship with their parents were better when their parents treated them with respect Yes. Right. And clearly they're not adults yet. No, they don't have, you know, the impulse control of adults yet, but they're close and they should be treated with increasing respect as if they were, you know, because, because they're almost adults. Right. Right. And when they felt like they were getting their respect from the parents, when the parents were genuinely curious about them as individuals, that's when they are more comfortable opening up and sharing things with the parents. And they're also more receptive to advice and guidance from parents. Yes. Because of that relationship. Right, right. When they believe that it's mutual, when they believe, when they've experienced, not just believe, right, when they've experienced that 
you're going to seriously consider the things that I point out or ask us questions or wonder about as long as I'm doing it in a respectful way towards you. And I'm therefore going to seriously consider the things that you point out or ask questions about or in a respectful way to me. Right. And that's not the same as just being like no boundaries, no curfew, no, right. Like it's, it's exactly. not that, right. It's not saying I don't care about your health and safety, but I think it helps me at least as a parent to distinguish between, yes, the frontal lobe is still developing up until 25. Right. And this is something that has, entered broader public consciousness, right? We realize, like, ooh, a lot of that kind of like long-term planning capacity, the ability to like thoroughly plan out and then follow the steps of a plan. But sometimes I think we confuse that taking longer to develop with analytical capacity. Analytical capacity, by the time you're a teenager, your analytical capacity is pretty close to fully, obviously variation, but pretty close to fully baked, right? So your ability to analyze diagnose, assess a situation is totally there, right? Your ability to like plan and map out all the steps required to reach a long-term goal, not totally there, but they're not the same thing. So we can engage with teens as meaningful thought partners in the analysis of what's going on, what do we think is contributing to that? You know, how might we approach it, right? Like all of that. It's just then when it turns to like coming around and being like, okay, and how are we going to execute on a plan about that? They're going to need more scaffolded support. They don't have those things kind of baked in and, and fully bred. But if we don't, if we do it for them, rather than modeling and involving them in the process of doing it, they're not going to learn it, right? Like when, like it, it's so, and I understand, right? I'm, I have two kids that I'm periodically get swapped up in the fear of like, what if they fail to launch? What if they never leave my house? Oh my God. Right. Like I get the fear so deeply, but sometimes the exact things that our fear drives us to do in the moment. Yeah. Oh my gosh, you're going to bomb. And I, and if you bomb high school, then you're never going to leave my house. Right. Will they like swoop in to fix the immediate problem of like, you're failing this class mm -hmm. rather than going like, Oh no, the, the reason you wouldn't leave my house if you failed high school is if you failed to build the skills to adult, right? Like it's not the high school diploma itself. So, so if we can lean into how am I going to help them build the skills they need mm -hmm. so that they can adult at some point when they're ready, that's going to pan out so much better for us than if we like swoop in to fix all the in the moment things while they're a teenager and then they turn 18 and we go okay i'm you know wash my hands cool go adult wait you're not prepared to okay go do four years of college then you'll be prepared to adult no they won't i'm a former college professor i guarantee you just going to college is not going to prepare them to adult right like it's not it's not going to miraculously happen just by virtue of being in a post-secondary institution exactly and this is a good time to bring up what you talk about in the book um about parents, if parents find themselves wanting to swoop in and fix stuff, we need to address why, why are we having this tendency to fix everything? Because yeah. I think that's a lot of the time when I talk to parents, I think that a lot of the time that has to do with the parents, um, their own issues, not the child's issues so much. Like, why yeah. do you feel the need to fix things? Why do you feel the need for your kid to present as perfect? I live outside of the Washington DC area, as you know, it is a hyper competitive area where everybody wants their kids to look perfect and everybody wants their kids to have perfect grades and be popular socially and go to the right schools and the right colleges and do the right things. I am much more concerned with, well, are you learning the skills you're going to need in life? Are you mentally and physically healthy, emotionally healthy, right? Those things. Um, and like you said, uh, Rebecca, like education is so much more than what happens in the in the classroom. And I've said a lot on this channel that like we travel a lot. Traveling is as much of an educational experience for kids as what they're learning in school. See the world. There's more than just us, right? That our little bubble. So it, it is really hard though for parents to go against the grain, especially if you live like in an area where I live. Like I feel the odd person out a lot of the time because yeah. my I don't want to say I'm more permissive, although sometimes I can be a little permissive. It's a different story. <laughs> but um, I'm less concerned with the perfect grades. I always tell my son, this is about learning the material, figuring out what you like and what you don't like. 
Yep. And learning life skills. That's what this is yep. about. We'll get to expectations for high school in a minute. That's important. You talk a lot about that in the book too. But um, that it's hard. But anyway, or to our original, my original point with this to emphasize was that when parents feel triggered to fix things and, oh my God, my kid is not performing perfectly or getting good grades or whatever, parents really need to look at why they feel triggered to fix things, why they feel triggered to swoop in and fix this problem and, uh, you know, and do it for the kids and over parent. Because as you said, um, and I read another great book this year called uh, Break Free from the Over Parenting Trap. And that author is, was, a, was a college professor as well and said just what you said that in ran, she ran to so many college students who were not prepared for life because their parents over parented and fixed everything and did things for them. And now they didn't know how to function independently. So we don't want to set our kids up like that. We want to give them the skills uh, the life skills and but a lot but that entails letting them do things on their own and letting them fail and that's hard for parents to watch sometimes but because you know we don't like it when our kids are suffering pain but that's part of life pain is suffering is part of life you have to learn to cope with that and deal with that yeah yeah um no are you talking just as a quick sign are you talking about julie lithcott hames book how to raise an adult yes. break free oh yes, yes. such a good book Really it's like book. a yeah. decade old and still totally applicable. Yeah, really and good book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I will say there's one thing I disagree a little bit with about that book. And I'm I'm happy that you brought up advocating for your kids in your book, How to how, Please Help Me Give a Shit, mm -hmm. um, because she talks about how kids don't respect, don't seem to respect authority because their parents are all, you know, baby boomer parents were always at, going in and you know, arguing with refs and coaches and things like this. Well, I feel a little bit differently about that. I would phrase it more like you phrase it in your book. Like it's very important that we advocate for our kids if, for example, they are not being treated fairly in schools by teachers, if they right. are not getting the resources they need. And by doing that, especially when our kids are young and not necessarily able to, they don't have the sophistication yet to advocate for themselves in those areas, to show them that we give a shit about them and also right. model how to advocate. So that I disagree with her on that. Like, I do not believe in just respecting authority because it's authority. There's a lot of incompetent authority out there. And we yeah. have to be very careful about groupthink. And I always say this, if my son's in a group where everybody else is doing the wrong thing, he has to be the one to say, no, I'm not doing this because I know who I am and I know this is wrong. So that's the one area I disagree with in her book, but I really am glad that you brought it up about the importance of advocating for our kids to make sure they get the resources they need at school. Yeah, well, and I think especially, you know, that's another one of those things that what advocacy means and looks like changes as they age, right? So the particular student that you're talking about, King, he was sharing stories where his parents really started to get involved and advocate at the elementary school level for him because he was he was actually being directly picked on and mistreated because of his race. He was in a primarily white uh, district and a primarily white school kids were saying inappropriate racial slurs the administration was doing literally nothing about it they were you know just like well i'm sure the kids meant well right like just and and the parents went in and got involved because here's their kid who's in elementary school going i don't feel like i belong i don't feel like i'm welcome just literally for something i can't change about myself um and that advocacy mattered, right? What that advocacy looked like changed as he got older. It became that finally they said, okay, you know what? If you want to homeschool by the time that he was entering high school, like you can homeschool, right? And we will support you in being able to do that, right? That's a different kind of advocacy of like, we've tried working with the school district. We've tried, tried working with the teachers. and We've encouraged you to be able to, and none of this is working. And now this is a matter of supporting you being confident and comfortable in who you are. Um, and that means that we have to have a different environment, right? So it wasn't that they went in and kept fighting his battles for him. It's that they said, okay, we're going to change the battlefield, right? We're going to, mm -hmm. we're going to allow for a different space so that you can actually continue to grow into adulthood and be able to learn the way that you need to learn. And that's a really different kind of advocacy than, than the, oh, you're not including my kid. You're not letting my kid get off the bench in the soccer game because they haven't practiced as much as the other kids. And now I'm going to go yell at the coach for not giving my kid as much playing time. Right. That's not, I don't know. I, I guess you can call that advocacy. I look at that and I go, no, that's, that's wanting to protect oh, your kid oh, from the consequences. Right. Yeah. Exactly. You're, 
more like right. You're like getting well, over involved. Mm -hmm. There are people make bad decisions. Reps make bad calls. Coaches make bad calls. Coaches sometimes don't treat all players fairly. Who knows? There could be a lot of everybody. You know, teachers, coaches, they're human too. They make mistakes. Fine. So some there's a point I think where yeah, I think there's a difference. I agree with you uh, regarding like like advocating for the well-being and kind of well, you know, sometimes life is unfair and sometimes there's not a lot you could do about it, but it doesn't mean you have to like it, but it's, that's very, that can get very nuanced and very sophisticated too. Like yeah. knowing where to direct your energy, knowing what battles to fight. That's, that's a thing adult struggle with, but yeah. but yeah, but it's definitely important to listen to your kids. If they're having a tough time at school for the reasons like King stated or a tough time with a teacher, it's important to listen to your kids as the kids get older you could ask, would you, how can I help with this? Is there anything you'd like me to do? Right. Would you like me to go talk to the teacher? And they say, if they say no, I would be, I would sometimes, you know, I myself would say, no, I'll talk to the teacher. Great. Let me know if you want, let me know if I can help in any way. Boom. That's it. But if you don't want me to talk to the teacher, if you want to handle it yourself or you just decide not to handle it, that's okay. That's your call. Right. right. So but it's important to do that, to, to kind of, like you said, shift how, how we advocate and how we parent as the kids get older and more independent and have them take on increasing levels of responsibility. Right. Knowing right. That they have the guidance from parents. Because it's that it's it's a little counterintuitive. It's that secure base they talk about in psychology. Like if you have a secure home base, you feel more comfortable taking risks and being independent because you have a secure exactly. base. Yes. Right. Yep. Cause and it's a little counterintuitive because a lot of parents, especially dads, think well, no, I'm not going to coddle him because they need to, they need to learn to do it on their own. Yes. But they need to be secure at home, feel secure with the parents, right. including emotionally secure to feel comfortable being independent. So it's important to remember that. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. It's kind of a, a way that I joke about sometimes friends where we'll sort of say like, yeah, life is not fair. That's true. Yeah. They'll get plenty of that from life. I don't need to add more to it. Right. Like exactly. I, I also don't need to take it away. Right. I don't need to falsely mm -hmm. buffer the unfairness right. that exists, but I don't need to like create additional challenge or, you know, hardship or whatever that's like coming from me. All that does is confuse and disrupt that, that secure base. Right. Like, exactly. um, yeah. yeah. If a teenager is asking the parent for help, really listen carefully because if they're coming to you asking for help, they need your help because yeah, that, kind that of goes is... against the mm -hmm. grain, right? So it's really yes, important. It does. I, I tell parents, man, drop everything and listen. They need you at that moment, even if they just yeah. want to talk about something. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. funny because you mentioned in the book to recognize, and this is, I totally resonated with this. It's almost like when you're in your, you know, 40s and 50s, when you have high schoolers and you're in your, many of us in our 40s and 50s, we feel more like set in our professional life. Like we feel very stable professionally. We've hit our mm -hmm. stride. Maybe some of us, are retiring early or thinking about, you know, ret early retirement soon or what we're going to do, but our kids are going through these enormous changes. And I love the quote from one of the, the teens in the, in the book that, you know, take away everything else. It's just hard being a teenager going through the dramatic mood shifts. It is just hard. Take away school, take away everything else. It's just hard being a teenager. So we yeah. parents have to remember that. I think like, okay, our life feels stable to us, but the teen is going through these changes. So just remember that this is a phase. And like I tell my son, everyone goes through this. You are not alone. Everyone has very similar experiences about belonging and what, what am I going to do with my life and thinking about these things. It is universal. You are not alone. We have resources. So it's important to remember that and, and not as parents not to take that personally, the mood swings or the irritation and things like that. It, it, it's hard not to take it personally if you if we don't, you know, if we have close relationships with our kids, but it's not about the parents. Yeah, it's not. And the other thing that that I frequently remind myself of is right along with all the other changes that are happening that just make it hard. And actually, I'm going to slightly detour because the particular student you're talking about, she was one that I was so in awe talking with her when she was sharing that particular context. Like, I just wish adults would have a bit more compassion for teens and not have it have to be some big reason. She was actually speaking that as someone who'd had one of those big reasons. Her mom 
had undergone massive cancer treatments for her entire middle school stretch and then pieces of high school where she was having to like where her mom and dad had to relocate to another place to get those treatments and she was having to live with an older sister there was a lot of uncertainty like she had a lot of those like big reasons for compassion and yet that her main takeaway was like wow this is this is really not fair i'm getting all of this compassionate response from my teachers and my peers aren't but they deserve just as much compassion as I do, just because this is hard, independent of the particular things that are happening in my family. This is just hard, right? And and I just, one of the things that I love most about talking to all these young people is realizing like we have so many stereotypes about teens when they're not your own kids. It's so much easier to genuinely be listening from a space of curiosity and compassion because you don't have all the burden of being like, it's my job to make sure you launch and that you adult and did I screw up and did it right? Like you just get to listen to them as people yeah. and you will be, I would challenge anyone to not walk away inspired. If you have five conversations with five different teens who are not your own kids mm -hmm. to not walk away inspired and hopeful about what is possible and really want to then enable more of that possibility. And that relates to the other piece that I, that I originally wanted to share, which is the other thing that is helpful to remember is that part of what's going on in teens' brains is literally their brains are changing the level of attention that they give to their parents and most especially to their mothers. Mm -hmm. Yay, isn't that great? Like there's yep. particular studies about this, right? Of like, like functional MRIs where like the brain's literally not even registering the sound of their mother's voice kind of thing, right? So it's like, Part of what? this, mm -hmm. part of this is also, how do I make sure that there is a good network of support around my teens so that yes, I can be that safe space if they do come to me, but also so that I can be pretty sure they have somebody to go to because it's probably not gonna be me, right? So who is it? It's like when I'm working with teens, then I'll talk with the parents afterwards. I'll be like, I talked with my kid about that cell phone thing a million times and they were just like, whatever, mom, whatever, mom. And you talk with them one time and now suddenly they're like, okay, I'll try this as an experiment. Yeah. And I was yep. like, because I'm not their parent. That's yep. the, it's the only reason they can hear it is that yep. I'm not their parent. Right. We just got to trade people. Like right. you talk with my kid, I'll talk with your kid or you hire a professional like I do, right? Like, but you, you get somebody else to talk with your teen who's not you. <laughs> Teens are hardwired not to listen to parents, just like you said, because they're individuating. Mm -hmm. And I read this, I can't remember for the life of me where I read it, one parenting or book recently, that it's like, so teens are you know, developing their own self-identity at this time. Before they develop the self-identity of what they are, they have to determine what they are not. So they yes. separate from the parents to determine what they are. And that's, you know, I respect that. And it is hard, like for all the reasons you said, because especially if we have very close relationships with our kids and we're used to them being more receptive to guidance from us, we still have a great, a great amount of influence on our kids. They see what we're doing, what we're, how we're handling things. So we have more influence over our teens than we think. We really do. But yes. it's not always apparent. And, and, and we have to kind of respect their journey. And I've said it before on this channel when I've interviewed other subject matter experts, um, who work with kids and teens that it's helpful to hire experts like coaches. Like I, you know, have a good friend who I interviewed on the channel, who's a writing coach to help with essay writing and things like this, because they'll take, they're, they're sometimes more responsive to the advice from those experts than from the parents. So, you know, that's, it really does take a village. Right? So it's helpful to have them, uh, and it's not, it has nothing to do with you not being a good enough parent by not being able to teach them this stuff. You are teaching this stuff, but they are hard, hardwired, their brains are hardwired not to listen to parents. And that is a survival skill I came to find exactly. out by research of childhood development of the teen brain. And I'm like, oh, that makes sense. But now that calmed a lot of my kind of angst and anxiety about that. So as long as I'm here for him, uh, and can support him and make sure he has the resources he needs. So that's right. helpful for parents to understand all that so that we can be a little bit more relaxed and enjoy yeah. the relationship with our kids more. Right, exactly. And and basically, you know, I think I think you summed it up perfectly, right? So basically they're not listening, but they are still watching. Yes. Right. And that was like the way that someone put it. I was like, oh, yes, that's exactly. They may not be listening to you anymore, but they are still watching you. Right. So basically the three things that we can do is make sure they have the resources they need, 
make sure we've created an open space for them to approach if they are willing to, right? If something's yes. really hit the fan and then make sure that we're modeling what it is because teens have an extra as one of the, the child psychiatrists that I spoke to and gathering stuff together, put it, she's like, listen, teens bullshit detector is through the roof. She's like, this is something that we tend to forget from when we were teenagers. But if you can try to like cast back your own memory to re-inhabit, or if you can put like they, the least little bit of hypocrisy, if you're trying to have a conversation about tech and they see that you've got your phone in your pocket at the dinner table and you're pulling it out regularly to be looking at things, that conversation is never going to happen. Right. Like, you know, and she was just giving all these examples of as someone that, you know, is a, a child psychiatrist that works primarily with adolescents. She's just like it. You just you can't even fathom the level of sensitivity of their bullshit detector. She's like just the teeny, teensy, tiniest little bit of hypocrisy detection. And that's it. You're, you are out. Yeah, you are like not will, someone that they're going to talk to. The most receptive to guidance from you because mm -hmm. of that. And because of that, they, like you said, they hate um, hypocrisy. They will not yeah. stand for it. And yeah. I, I, like, I'm always honest with my kid. They, I, the, a couple of times I wasn't, man, he knew right away. <laughs> he just knew there's <laughs> no point. Be honest. Or if you don't want to address something, look, I'm really not ready to talk about this, but just be honest. And yeah. you know, like Mark Manson says, if you want trust, you have to give trust. If you yeah. want honesty, you have to give honesty. So yeah. um, that's a whole, we could talk for another whole session about. Uh, <laughs> I know. Um, but uh, yeah, all good stuff. And make sure they have, so I want to talk to you a little bit about the resources. You mentioned a lot of great resources. Man, I didn't even think about this. Um, like the dual enroll enrollment, dual mm -hmm. high school college credits so that kids can, mm -hmm. and we have this with one of the, uh, community colleges where I live. Um, so kids can get like an associate's degree by the time they're yep. like 15 yep. um, and doing online courses. We have so many alternatives that we did not have when you and I were that age. Exactly. We don't have to sit for six to seven hours a day in a school anymore. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. So there are a lot of like, like a third of the kids I found out. So we have a, in the County where I live, there's a home study program um mm -hmm. where kids who for medical reasons can't go to school they the county sends a teacher to 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 what is it called homebound instruction to do homebound mm -hmm. instruction. Mm -hmm. 30 percent of the kids that are qualifying for that in the county it's because of mental uh diagnoses like anxiety mm -hmm. things like this but that's a great alternative because um you know so those kids can actually learn and enjoy learning and not be in a harmful environment so we have all mm -hmm. these resources that we didn't have decades yeah. ago. Um, and yeah. I'm so glad you brought those up in your book because I was I was thinking, oh yeah, I don't even think about this. The dual enrollment, for example, you know, because some kids learn more quickly than others. So mm -hmm. if you can um, you know, uh do a program at your own pace and then you can free up some of your time for other things you may want to do, all all these things that are available. So I really encourage parents to to check out those resources in your book and other local resources. Yeah. Uh, if you have anything to say about that, I'll give you the floor. Yeah, no, that was the biggest. I, listen, a little bit of my motivation in talking with all these young people it started to become selfish as I as I talked with more of them. So I'm like, ooh, I've got a middle schooler. If I can start to learn more about what options are out there that I wouldn't have even thought to look for, then I'm going to be better equipped, right? So that resources part of parenting. No, I don't. I'm not going to tell him what choice he needs to make, but I can come to him and share. Hey, let me so that as you're preparing to go into high school, or if you're already in high school, but you're in the early stages and you don't realize there's all these options, you can commute and take courses from the technical school. And then you're getting more hands-on applied learning. You can do dual enrollment, but here's the particular dual enrollment options that are available in our school district. If you go to like in our particular school district, I learned that if you're at, you can choose between the two high schools. If you're in one of them, you can do certain kinds of dual enrollment. If you're in the other one, you're only eligible to do this other type of dual enrollment, right? So like the high school you pick to go to, which most kids are just picking based on, I don't know, whatever. I talked with my buddy the day that we had to fill out the form and he said he's doing this one. So I'm doing that one too, right? Like without realizing there can be meaningful differences um, in these kinds of things. One of the students I interviewed, it was part of a politically, I have to admit that I struggle with anything related to charter schools, but in relation to student choice, there, there can be a lot to be said for that. And he had, you know, opted to go into, there was like a 
charter choice public network where there was a whole range of multiple different kinds of Votech schools where the whole high school experience was a Votech experience. And it caused me to realize that I was associating Votech to mean student who was definitely not college bound. We already knew that. And so they're going to a Votech school in order to learn welding or plumbing or electric or something like that, right? I did not realize that Votech had been massively expanded in many cases to mean architecture, business courses, software, like, you know, hardware, like a whole bunch more than it used to be when you and I were in high school. And I just would, I felt like such an idiot because I was like, I never would have thought to look. I never would have even thought to ask or inquire. And the way that all these students learned about these things was from older friends or older siblings, right? So it all got like passed down through word of mouth and they just got lucky, right? And like, that's terrible. It was, their schools weren't doing a good job advertising these options. Yeah. It wasn't, nobody knew. They just got lucky in hearing about it. And it made me so much more cognizant of like, I got to look because no, I can't afford to send my kid to an expensive private school. Mm -hmm. But if there's other options public school wise that I'm not aware of and are not well advertised, I got to find that stuff out now so that he knows so that even if he does choose to take the high school that he would have gone to anyways, it will then at least have been a choice, right? It won't just be exactly to, and that will help his motivation because instead of it just being like, well, I just went there because that's where I was told to go. It's, well, I was looking between my options of Votech, this high school, the other high school, this program with, you know, and I decided this is really the best one for me. And this is why. Now, boom, you've automatically got an uptick in engagement because even if they're routed to specific classes, it's within a broader framework of I chose to be here for a reason, not just I was slotted here and I'm resentfully following directions. Be more committed if they choose to, if they make the choice, right? It's yeah. an informed choice because people yeah. who, who do things because they feel pressured are not going to follow through or be committed to that or there's going to be resentment. Right. So, you know, that's a good... Um, subject to kind of uh end on here is kids really you know it's helpful and important to give teens more say in their experience including the educational experience mm -hmm. and uh a lot of the 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 teachers that you talked about that the kids you interview talked about in your book those teachers solicited uh you know feedback from kids and engaged kids in conversation and were enthusiastic for the subject matter and i've noticed uh, where I live, that the kids, the classes they do really well and are and enjoy are where they like the teachers. They feel a connection with the teacher and they feel that the teacher cares about them. Yep. Yep. Oh, yeah. That and was the biggest know. predictor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, they know. They know when the teacher doesn't like them. They know. They know. Yeah. And, and that's yeah. true. Teachers are human. Yes, they're going to have favorite students. And a lot of the times I noticed when I saw was in middle school, the girls were favored because the girls could sit quietly for six hours. Mm -hmm. Boys couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. Normal development, but clearly, like, and that's that's a whole other issue. And I interviewed an an expert on raising boys. I that's a if you guys haven't watched that video with Kathy Imabayashi, please go check it out. A lot of really good information specifically for raising sons in that kind of environment and helping them thrive. But um, but yeah, it's uh yeah, that's so important. And look, my hats off to teachers. They're overworked. They're underpaid. Yes. But to the extent that they can do that, really engage the students and show uh, that they care about the students' performance, that they care about if the students are learning the material or not, you know, stay, you know, stay with the students uh, during, you know, help them during office hours or uh, talk to them outside of class, they need extra help. Like that's so, that's so important. And those are the, the, the classes that the students really enjoy and thrive in and want to do well in, right? Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of these teachers figured out alternative ways to even structure their within class time to allow them to yeah. be able to circulate and help students, you know, one to one or in small group within. So, I mean, there's a variety of ways. Listen, I have I, I have been an educator in various forms for a long time. It is a brutally hard job. I have absolutely no shade on any teacher, any, okay, maybe some that are just like outright cruel, but generally no shade on any teacher. They are not rewarded for caring and connecting. They are rewarded for test scores, right? And so if we want as parents for teachers to engage with our kids as humans rather than as test takers, then we need to be putting the pressure on our school boards 
within our local political environment to say, hey, what's measured gets treasured. And guess what we aren't measuring currently? We are not paying any attention to this. And in the meantime, we can express genuine gratitude or help our students realize why it matters for them to express genuine gratitude to the teachers that are going above and beyond, that are not only meeting the requirements around test stuff, but also doing that relational work that is difficult and rewarding work. Because if they hear, I will speak from my own experience, anytime a student came to me and thanked me, it gave me a giant like burst of energy to do so much more in, you know, da, 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 because it is hard and usually thankless work. And you know abstractly that you're making a difference for some of the students. But if a student takes the trouble to actually come back to you and say, wow, thank you. When you did blank, that was really helpful for me. Like it really helped me learn or just thank you. I can tell you actually care about me or whatever the thing is. If you like a teacher, please God let them know, not just because it's the nice thing to do, but because it's going to give them the energy to keep doing that right. and make it more likely that other teachers do that because th now they're getting something back to show them that the, that the effort is worthwhile. That, that appreciation is so important. Um, we, yeah, we did that. Now, my son's middle school was understaffed, frankly. Um, and, and uh, it's just, it's tough to find teachers around here, you know. Uh, so we have a large, it's a large population. So, um, and we wrote thank you cards and sent emails. Thank you for all the support, you know, to the, those teachers that were really supportive of of my son. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I, that personal appreciation is really important. It's important to yeah. acknowledge that that yeah, it's hard, and we really appreciate the support. Um, yeah. yeah. And there were certain teachers I could tell they were really cared about, it wasn't just, you know, checking boxes, they cared about learn him learning the material, they cared about how to help him finish the work on time. And that was like appreciated beyond belief. So yeah, you want to yeah. make sure and, that you're communicating that. Yeah. Yeah. And actually communicating that and not just signing the group card at the end yeah, and contributing just, well, to the leaving, gift. Leaving a gift is great, but that right. personal, like, I see what you've done and I really, we really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, every time, I mean, it, not to not do the gifts, but like I, if I had, yeah. if I'd had to pick anytime, I would much rather have the personal note or, or a three sentence conversation yeah. than the object left on my desk. Right. Like that I right. would much rather know that I made a difference to somebody that is so rewarding and gives me the energy to keep doing the work right and so right. where that can be encouraged um with direct communication with teachers or as your kids get older letting them know why that matters and why it will help them get more of what they want right why it will help them get more of the type of teaching that they want if they're creating that kind of reward system for it um so right. that they can be informed because my, my i mean my kids you know like they're very the older one is very embarrassed he's very shy it's like i don't want to that's that's embarrassing i don't want i'm like let's talk this through. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think being able to say yeah. thank you to people and mean it is also a life skill that's useful for adults. Yeah. yeah. And, and <laughs> so. if you were in their position of how would you feel getting a thank you? Like you probably make exactly. you feel good. So yeah, exactly. Well, I understand. I mean, middle schoolers, they're easily embarrassed. <laughs> by everything. Yeah. Oh, by everything. By oh, everything. It's, it's like, no, uh, yeah. Don't, don't do anything to them. <laughs> My kid would say, don't do anything to embarrass me. I'm like, that's a tall order. Like, yes. bear, my breathing <laughs> embarrasses you. If I, if I, right, yeah. if I exist, my yeah, existence so like, is embarrassing to you. So um, what do you want me to do here? He's like, okay. So uh, uh, it's we always laugh. It's, you got to laugh about that stuff. Oh, He's yeah. like, I remember, I remember very clearly how it was for me as a kid. That's another thing is I encourage parents when I work with parents, I said, look, think about when you were a teen. Oh, it was terrible. I'm like, what did you need? Well, I wanted people to listen to me. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I want people to acknowledge what I was going through. Yes. <laughs> I wanted people to understand that I was trying my best. I'm like, yes. So you remember what it was like for you. It's very similar for your kid now. Like yeah. think about what yeah. you needed as a teen, right? But yeah, so I can, I can relate. To my to my kid because I remember very clearly what it was like going through middle school and high school. Yeah. yeah. So it's important to remember that, to have the that that experience too, the the relatable experience and and just yeah. acknowledge that. It's tough and you'll get through it. And uh yeah, so this has been a great conversation, Rebecca. Thank you so much. And I love your perspective because you're a mom and you're a teacher, right? So you have all this this different perspective from from uh, those areas. Um, so anyway, yeah, definitely encourage everybody to check out the book. Can you help me give a shit by Rebecca Block? And your co-author is Grace 
Grace Edwards. Mm -hmm. Grace Edwards. Yeah. So yeah. really, really good book. I, I love um, the fact that you cited a lot of studies and data too um, in the book. That's very helpful uh, to parents. And uh, it was really validating to hear that. Um, last big question for you before we wrap up and, and get your contact info and stuff is what, so what, because you talk about parents' expectations for kids, especially teens, like in high school and how that can help them foster that autonomous motivation. Like what, what expectations should parents, I don't want to say should, what expectations would you recommend parents think about for their yeah. high schoolers to help them kind of encourage their own autonomous motivation? Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, different words work better for different people, right? Expectations, mm -hmm. boundaries, you know, parameters, right? Like whatever the thing is that allows you to have a conversation, but the piece that matters, that really mattered when both looking at the research and also engaging directly in these conversations with young people is that whatever those parameters are, they're crystal clear. There's not any hidden or unspoken like, well, you know, what I've told you is I just want you to do well and be prepared as an adult. But what I mean is if you come back with anything less than an A, I'm going to be quietly judging you and or giving you a consequence, right? Like, so make sure that the, that the, the parameters are actually clear. Make sure that there is a clear reason for them, right? Like it doesn't mean they have to like them, but that hypocrisy piece, right? There's a clear reason that is aligned with your values as a family. And finally, check to see if those parameters, boundaries, expectations you're setting, if, if all of them are actually necessary, if any of them are going to sacrifice your ability to connect with your child. And what I mean by that, to give an example, is that some of the examples that teens talked with me about is where they felt like that what their family's expectations were, were about their identity rather than about their behavior, right? They expected them to not be queer. They expected them to not have mental health struggles. They expected them to not be bothered by being, you know, the only black girl in the science classes that they were, right? So they, the, those types of expectations, I expect you to be someone other than who you are, are not the kind of helpful, clear boundary setting allows us to be on the same page sort of expectations or, or boundaries or parameters as something like, hey, we expect that you're going to pass all your classes. We expect that you're going to be home by midnight. We expect the phone is going to be off and put away by 9 p.m. Here's the reasons why, right? Those types of expectations are very clear. Um, it allows for consistency. It allows for we don't need to keep negotiating these things over and over again. Mm -hmm. And then it allows for also greater like, and it is freedom beyond those particular ones. Um, and so that was what I really appreciated learning about both from the secondary research that's written a lot about the, the difference between authoritative, authoritarian and permissive parenting, right? You can find plenty of stuff about that, the research, but the stories that the students that we interviewed really shared, especially Connor, if you're looking for good stories in the book about this, he really went in depth about the particulars of his relationship with his parents. And I was taking a lot of notes as a parent myself. Okay. Yeah. I was like, can, Connor, can I maybe like talk with your parents and like get some direct pointers here about how, you know, how they yeah. set this all up so well. So um, does that answer your question? It does. And it's interesting because the, like, I remember Con Connor's relationship with his parents really stood out because his parents were so, you know, forward thinking, like so interested in him. He's the one who said they're interested in me as an individual. And we ask each other questions and I'm curious about them and they're curious about me. And it's interesting. Like, it, and they also had these expectations for him, like, you know, pass your classes, take this opportunity to find, figure out what you like, what you don't like. Don't get into major trouble. It's a big one we have at home. No drugs, no illegal activity, no underage drinking. Right. Clearly there are reasons for that. But they also gave him the freedom to be out with his friends until 3 a.m. Right. Right. Occasionally, not on a school night, occasionally. Yeah. yeah. You know, and so that was interesting. And it's like, the more, you know, the clearer the expectations and, and the more the respect for his budding independence, the more autonomous motivation he had. Yep. Yep. And that's, exactly. it, it's, it's a little, to a lot of parents, that's counterintuitive, less control, but some clarity and communication and respect actually leads to the autonomous motivation right right more control if you control somebody they don't have to think about 
what to do. Right. You're right. controlling them. Right. Exactly. And then they don't have the choices. They don't feel the sense yeah. of belonging with you. They don't feel like they yeah. have abilities because obviously if you thought they had abilities, yes, you'd be letting them competent. make right. They, they feel mm -hmm. incompetent. They, that they're incapable of doing it. That was a lot of yep. my experience as a child. That's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about that subject is um, yeah. to respect the independence. Yeah. So that's great. Yeah. Great. Yeah. That's Connor's experience was really singular in that respect. Yeah. Yeah. His parents yeah. really like ahead of the time. Um, Rebecca, is there anything you want to share with viewers before we close out today? Um, just, talk? just like you can come and find me at beccablock.com. We've got various socials related to the book. Um, uh, on Instagram, it's at Can You Help Me Give a. I think there's even a TikTok. I have some wonderful young people who are building their portfolios by me, just basically being like, run with it. I yeah. do not love social media. So, uh, so forgive me for not remembering, but you can find all the links uh, gotcha. from the, the website. And, so, uh, on your Facebook page. Yeah. And the book's available on Amazon too. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Do you do coaching and courses as well? Yeah, so I do coaching. Um, right now, I don't have any courses running. I've done courses before, and I'm open to doing them again if there's a group that wants to do a course. Um, but right now, I do more one-to-one -one coaching with young people and with families, um, and then also do consulting with either parent groups or school groups that are looking to sort of say, like, how do we structurally, systemically within our school bring in more of these supports for motivation so that students can feel engaged um, and really be learning. Thank you so much for your time today. This has been a great conversation. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much. All right, take care.